the beast. And because of the important role that artists and cultural workers are playing in this struggle, and it's becoming clearer and clearer every single day. Raise your hand if you were um, at the Nakba Day rally just a couple of hours ago. <laughs> wow. Yes. It's amazing to see the amount of mobilization that is happening every single day. We're in the streets for Palestine. We're here in solidarity with Cuba. There are so many connections in the relationships between, between the struggles against imperialism for liberation in Cuba, in, in uh, Palestine, and so we're just thrilled for this evening to be, to be happening. We've seen so much intense struggle for liberation in Palestine over the last several months. People are rising up against the destruction, um, the Israeli genocide, and across the entire world, we're seeing pe people take up principal stances and getting creative with actions, demanding for an end to the genocide, for a permanent and immediate ceasefire, and for the total liberation of Palestine. And this movement has, liberate, has, has mobilized millions of people around the world, and many for the first time who are taking to the streets. And artists and cultural workers are demanding an end to the genocide and are using their artistic work and practices as tools used towards liberation. This is sort of the position through which Artists Against Apartheid, which is a network of over 15,000 artists and cultural workers with different kinds of audience came to fruition. The ruling class and our oppressors are using culture to transform to transform society, and it is time that we claim our own practices as artists and use them to build our revolutionary causes. So it is within this context of struggle and in this moment when artists and cultural workers are taking up the torch of liberation that we have the great honor to welcome to New York and to the People's Forum the revolutionary poet Nancy Morejon. <laughs> Nancy, Nancy is known as the best and most widely translated poets of revolutionary Cuba, has led the charge in envisioning and building a literary tradition in Cuba and around the world that speaks to, liber to liberation and emancipation. She's a st strong fighter against imperialism and a supporter of the revolutionary process and has inspired a generation of revolutionary writers, artists, and cultural workers. Her work addresses race, class, gender, history, politics, Afro-Cuban identity, and her poems are vibrant reflections of Cuba and the continued process of revolution. So it is our utmost pleasure here at the People's Forum, a space of political education, of, of internationalism, and of culture, to bring Nancy to the stage to read a selection of her poems, which are also available in the chapbook that we're releasing tonight and to be able to have a conversation with Nancy about what it looks like as artists to mobilize today, to make work today, and how this next generation of artists that are, that are working towards liberation in our work can envision the future and envision our processes together. So give one more round of applause for Nancy. <laughs> Good evening. It's lovely to be here, and it's lovely to join you in your perspective for peace in our world. I want to give thanks for the chance of inviting me to read some poems. And also, I would like to thank the People's Forum for this edition, it's a brand new edition, a, a, a brief anthology, very beautiful, very refined, of the poems that I will be reading to you. Of course, they have been written in, in, in Spanish, and they have the, the very original translations in English. So there will be a young poet, that I have met recently, 10 minutes ago, that will read. <laughs> he will read the, the English translations. Of course, um, I, will, I will begin uh, reading a poem, very old poem, a uh, very important poem to my mother. Uh, and I'm always remembering a quotation by 
greatest writer, Virginia Woolf, who stated that behind every woman writer, there is the ghost of a mother. Madre. Mi madre no tuvo jardín, sino islas acantiladas, flotando bajo el sol en sus corales delicados. No hubo una rama limpia en su pupila, sino muchos garrotes. Qué tiempo aquel cuando corría descalza sobre la cal de los orfelinatos y no sabía reír y no podía siquiera mirar el horizonte. Ella no tuvo el aposento de marfil, ni la sala de mimbre, ni el vitral silencioso del trópico. Mi madre tuvo el canto y el pañuelo para acunar la fe de mis entrañas, para alzar su cabeza de reina de su vida y dejarnos sus manos como piedras preciosas frente a los restos fríos del enemigo. My mother had no garden, but rather steep islands floating beneath the sun on their delicate corals. She had no clean branch in her eye, but many garotes. What a time that was when she ran barefoot on the limestone of orphanages. And she did not know how to laugh, and she could not gaze at the horizon. She had no ivory chamber, nor a wicker parlor, nor the silent stained glass of the tropics. My mother had the song and the handkerchief to cradle my heart's faith, to lift her head of a queen ignored, and to leave us her hands like precious stones before the cold remains the enemy. And I wanted to make a tribute to the translator of this poem, Heather Rosario Sievert. She passed away many, many years ago, and she was a scholar in this city for Spanish-speaking people, especially Puerto Ricans. Mirar adentro. Del siglo XVI data mi pena, y apenas lo sabía porque aquel ruiseñor siempre canta en mi pena. From the 16th century dates my sorrow, and I hardly knew it, because that nightingale always sings in my sorrow. Negro, tu pelo para algunos era diablura del infierno, pero el sunsun allí puso su nido sin reparos cuando pendías en lo alto del horcón frente al palacio de los capitanes. Dijeron sí que el polvo del camino te hizo infiel y violáceo como esas flores invernales del trópico siempre tan asombrosas y arrogantes. Ya moribundo sospechan que tu sonrisa era salubre y tu musgo impalpable para el encuentro del amor. Otros afirman que tus palos de monte nos trajeron ese daño sombrío que no nos deja relucir ante Europa y que nos lanza en la vorágine ritual a ese ritmo imposible de los tambores innombrables. Nosotros Amaremos por siempre tus huellas y tu ánimo de bronce, porque has traído esa luz viva del pasado fluyente 
ese dolor de haber entrado limpio a la batalla, ese afecto sencillo por las campanas y los ríos, ese rumor de aliento libre en primavera que corre al mar para volver y volver a partir. Mujer negra, todavía huelo la espuma del mar que me hicieron atravesar. La noche no puedo recordarla, ni el mismo océano podría recordarla. Pero no olvido al primer alcatraz que divisé, altas las nubes como inocentes testigos presenciales. ¿Acaso no he olvidado ni mi costa perdida, ni mi lengua ancestral? Me dejaron aquí y aquí he vivido. Y porque trabajé como una bestia, aquí volví a nacer. ¿A cuánta epopeya mandinga intenté recurrir? Me rebelé. Su merced me compró en una plaza. Bordé la casaca de su merced y un hijo macho le parí. Mi hijo no tuvo nombre y su merced murió a manos de un impecable Lord Inglés. Anduve. Esta es la tierra donde padecí boca abajo y azotes. Bogué a lo largo de todos sus ríos. Bajo su sol sembré, recolecté y las cosechas no comí. Por casa tuve un barracón. Yo misma traje piedras para edificarlo pero canté al natural compás de los pájaros nacionales. Me sublevé. En esta misma tierra toqué la sangre húmeda y los huesos podridos de muchos otros, traídos a ella o no, igual que yo. Ya nunca más imaginé el camino a Guinea. Era a Guinea, a Benín, era a Madagascar o a Cabo Verde. Trabajé mucho más, fundé mejor mi canto milenario y mi esperanza. Aquí construí mi mundo. Me fui al monte. Mi real independencia fue el palenque y cabalgué entre las tropas de Maceo. Solo un siglo más tarde, junto a mis descendientes, desde una azul montaña, Bajé de la sierra para acabar con capitales y usureros, con generales y burgueses. Ahora soy, solo hoy tenemos y creamos. Nada nos es ajeno. Nuestra la tierra, nuestros el mar y el cielo, nuestras la magia y la quimera. Iguales míos, Aquí los veo bailar alrededor del árbol que plantamos para el comunismo. Su pródiga madera ya resuena. Black woman. I still smell the foam of the sea they made me cross. The night, I can't remember it. The ocean itself could not remember that, but I can't forget the first goal I made out in the distance. High, the clouds, like innocent eyewitnesses. Perhaps I haven't forgotten my lost coast or my ancestral language. They left me here and here I lived. And because I worked like an animal, here I was reborn. How many Mandiga epics did I that I look to for strength. I rebelled. His worship brought me in a public square. I embroidered his worship's coat and bore him a male child. My son had no name, and his worship died at the hands of an impeccable English lord. I walked. This is the land where I suffered mouth in the dust and the lash. I rode the length of all its rivers. Under its sun, I planted seeds, brought in crops, 
but never ate those harvests. A slave barracks was my house, built with stones that I hauled myself, while I sang to the pure beat of native birds. I rose up. In this same land, I touched the fresh blood and decayed bones of many others brought to this land or not the same as I. I no longer dreamt of the road to Guinea. Was it to Guinea, Benin, to Madagascar, or Cape Verde? I worked on and on. I strengthened the foundations of my millinery song and of my hope. Here I built my world. I left for the hills. My real independence was the free slave fort, and I rode with the troops of Maceo. Only a century later, together with my descendants from a blue mountain, I came down from the Sierra to put an end to capital and usurer, to generals and to the bourgeois. Now I exist. Only today do we own, do we create. Nothing is foreign to us. The land is ours. Ours, the sea and the sky, the magic and the vision, my equals. Here I see you dance. Around the tree we are planting for communism. Its prodigal wood resounds. Right. <laughs> two, two, two last poems. The first one is a tribute to George Floyd. And uh, it was written, it was an, a personal upheaval. I felt uh, hurt because it was a very, the very beginning of 21st century and suddenly, you know, uh, a black man killed by a policeman. Como un nido. El cuerpo de George Floyd es el cauce del río. La poesía es un nido. Los pájaros, sus dueños. El cuerpo de George Floyd es el cauce del río. Su alma es el agua que fluye en su fragancia hacia los montes, hacia la mar azul, hacia todos los ríos. El cuerpo de George Floyd es este río. Like a nest. The body of George Floyd is the riverbed. Poetry in his nest. Birds his masters. The body of George Floyd is the riverbed. His soul is the water that flows in its fragrance towards the woods towards the blue sea, towards all rivers. The body of George Floyd is this river. This poem, which I'm gonna read now to end the poetry reading, was written in the very first, the very first years of the beginning of 21st century. It was published in Spain, which means that the tragedy of Palestinian people has been always there. I mean by that, that it did not have started in October 7, 2023. It was started many years ago, many years ago. In 1948, ever since we have, we have been witnesses of what I cannot call in English properly, but uh, 
I, I would like to remember Fidel's sentence when he said in the United Nations in 1960, Filosofia del despojo. This philosophy, you know, or on taking and on living people, it's still alive. And it is a genocide. A genocide. We, we, we cannot find another word for, for denouncing that. Although this poem was written at the very beginning of 21st century, its name is the name of a village in Liban, or Lebanon. And I wrote it, and it was published in Spain, in a, a small press, beautiful small press, in, in Salamanca, Spain. So it's not from October 7. And it is, uh, it's awful to taste that blood that still is going and going on around our, uh, our consciousness. The name of the village is Cana. Oh Dios, si existes. No he dudado de tu existencia. Esa pregunta lanzada al vórtice de los vacíos es un gorrión con las alas quemadas, como una gruta sorda por donde caminamos sin rumbo hasta que el cuerpecito ensangrentado de una niña inocente impide el paso. Luego, Hay un sonido atronador que nos lleva hasta un letrero que dice Cana. Oh Dios, si existes, ¿cómo podrías explicar tanto sadismo, tanta crueldad, tanta aberración? Es alucinante ver la sangre de una niña brotar, la sangre de una niña yerta, 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 su mirada, agua de alondras, yerta. Brota la sangre de su cabeza, de sus piernecitas, oh Dios, de todos los días. Cualquiera que fuese tu nombre, o tu pasado, o tu origen, donde quiera que hayas reinado o sufrido, donde quiera que te hayan rendido culto, ven a calmarla. Ven a mitigar su dolor y mi espanto. Ven y acúnala en tus brazos. Ven en su auxilio porque mis lágrimas no pueden hacer nada, ni mis ruegos, ni mis versos inciertos. Haz posible la cordura entre los hombres y sus familias, entre las mujeres y sus familias, entre las niñas y los niños y sus familias, desencontradas o encontradas de todo el orbe, y que los culpables de estos crímenes paguen por ellos. Cana. Oh God, if you exist, I have not doubted your existence. That question, hurled into the vortex of all emptiness, is a sparrow with burnt wings, like a cave with no exit, in which, which we wander, aimless, until the tiny bloodied body of an innocent little girl blocks the path. Then. There's a thundering sound that leads us to a sign that reads, Ghana. Oh God, if you exist, what explanation could you have for actions so sadistic, so cruel, so abhorrent? It is stunning to see the blood pouring out of a little, the blood of a little girl so stiff, stiff stiff. Her gaze waters for larks, 
stiff. The blood pours from her head, from her tiny legs. O oh God of every day, whatever your name or your past or your origin, wherever you may have reigned or suffered, wherever you may have been worshiped, come calm her down, come ease her pain and my horror. Come and cradle her in your arms. Come in her aid because my tears are helpless, just like my prayers, just like my uncertain verses. Make sanity possible between men and their families, between women and their families, between little girls and boys and their families, unfound or found from all over the world. And may those guilty of these crimes pay for them. Thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing those poems. And thank you to Jalen Strong for reading the, the translation. It was beautiful. I think it was really perfect to end on that note, on, with that poem in particular, because, um, well, because of the day today, in that so many people who are in this room right now and who are watching on the live stream from across the country and around the world are participating today in a global day of action for Palestine that we're commemorating the Nakba and rising up against the genocide that's happening right now. And a lot of the people who are in this room are part of Artists Against Apartheid and are artists who are using their practices as tools towards liberation. And um, and clearly, this poem is part of that tradition. In fact, this poem um, was published in the first Artists Against Apartheid newspaper in November of, of this past year, and we, we really saw it as, it as an inspiration, as something to look towards for what art can, what can, art can look like in, as a tool. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the, the vision that you had in creating that poem and in using, and, and using your practice um, in the struggle. Well, thanks for the invitation to read poems. Not everywhere you are invited to read poems. Because some people f feel and think that poetry is useless. Poetry is not useless. It's a howl. It's a way of yelling. It was my way of yelling against, the, it was my personal upheaval against that awful violence that I could not imagine would come back because the poem was written uh, in spite of a, a, a crime in, in Cana, which is in the, in the name of the town in Liban, Lebanon. Sorry about that, Lebanon. And can you imagine that suddenly, decades after that crime, we're coming back to a worst situation it's a massive genocide in which uh, no one can reclaim the natural humanity that humankind deserves. So we are stuck. We started again uh, looking at in the news everywhere in networks, you know, in digital world, whatever, those images. So it doesn't matter if it is digital or not. The awful thing is that they are 
burning houses, destroying cities and bridges and windows and a grandmother that goes with her grandson to school, they are shot. And we're supposed to accept it as a natural thing. And we're supposed to be in the most developed society. Are we developed? Killing here and killing there. And, 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 and killing a whole city and buildings and things and destroying a city in the behalf of what? What is the sense of superiority of those who shoot a girl, a little girl that I, that I denounce in my poem? So it is so sad, I feel sad, of course. And, and nothing happens because I think that all the structures are sleepy, at least. They're sleeping. So we see that the invasion moves here and there, and it's so awful, so awful. So my poem is not useless. I don't think so. But it's so sad to come back to a, an issue that you denounced decades decade ago, and suddenly it's rebirth, and it's reborn. So uh, I defend the, the, the right of poets of using poetry as a tool of civilization. We, I say in Spanish, la poesía es un bien común y tiene que ser un bien de todos. It's, a, it's something good for everybody. And through that, you know, although it's helpless, uh, I, I condemned those actions, those bitter and evil actions, because there is a kind of evilness in those murders, massive murders, that you cannot accept. Because the wor Western world is, is, is not better than any other part of the world. <laughs> so if, if you understand that feeling of myself, I feel satisfied at least. That's what I can, that's what I can do gather some friends, to gather some people, and to talk about these things honestly. And uh, it's unacceptable, you know, it's unbelievable what is going on in terms of, of, of this genocide. It's a genocide. I think it's interesting that you talk about the usefulness of poetry because I think that's something that, that we've been thinking a lot about in the last several months. And it's interesting because, you know, people might say, like you're saying, there's critique that, you know, th this isn't useful, this isn't um, the top priority. But we see that, the, we see the power of poetry, we see the power of writing, we see the power of art all the time, especially when this work is sometimes censored, blatantly censored. We've seen a censorship of artists occur, especially in the last six months, of artists who are actively speaking out about Palestine. But you are no, um, you're not far away from the censorship of art because your work has been censored multiple times, even in the last year. Um, and so I wonder if you could speak to what, what that means in today's society and how we can combat this censorship of, of artists who speak against imperialism. Yes, but let me tell you, my, the censorship doesn't come from Cuba. No. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's right. It's, it, it, it's, it's from abroad. Of course, yes. Let's say that it's from abroad. 
It was a very ridiculous chapter in Western world. And uh, I did not suffer because I have an experience living in Cuba and you know we have a, a daily dialogue in terms of, of these things. And I have been always trained by my people. So it, is, it, would, it was not a surprise. But anyway, it was astonishing, astonishing. But what I'm trying to mean is that upper hate came back. Upper hate came back. I was very engaged in the struggle against upper hate and especially for the release of Nelson Mandela at the beginning of the, of, of, of the 90s. And I did have the, the honor and the joy of visiting uh, South Africa. And uh, during that visit, uh, Mandela was released. We were talking about that with my friends Nadine Gordimer and uh, Willy Cosicili. But one of the things that I think the People's Forum has gained is to recover that word, apartheid. Not many people make a relationship between what is going on in Gaza with apartheid. But it's apartheid. And we have to be against apartheid again. Very strongly, very strongly, we cannot be deceived. We cannot be uh, naive and to think that it's just a word. No, 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 no. It's a whole system that started again, a, a machinery. Plenty of forces, plenty of resources, plenty of soldiers. What is the right of a policeman or a soldier to stop and to shoot someone? It's not fair. It is not civilized. Where is going to go our civilization? Where are we going to go with that blood around, you know, neighborhoods and schools and, you know, all kinds of things? So I do trust, although I don't love slogans. I have never been a fanatic of slogans. I have never practiced slogans, but there's there, at some point, you have to rebel. You have to. It's impossible to understand the world and to be quiet in front of a crime of a, a six-year-old girl, which is the subject of my poem. So I re reviewed the poem and I said, "My goodness, I, I wrote I wrote the poem around 2007, 2006 or 2007." And to know that that poem actually is, is it's, it's, it's real. There is a reality for that, mo for that moment. It never went by. So I'm really pleased to, to see that here in People's Forum, you are doing a wonderful wo work, a wonderful work for this issue. Only for this issue you, you would be useful and respected. Useful and respected. Well, thank you. We're, we're learning, we're growing, we're, we're trying to do the best we can all the time, and so that's appreciated. Um, what you're saying, the way that you're talking about the necessity of, of building a strong movement against apartheid today, in a similar way to the strength of the movement in South Africa, I think is really important. It's what we, um, it's it's really a huge inspiration for artists against apartheid and out young of the people. Space. I think young people, you should review that moment and to understand what happened even in this country with the apartheid. Yeah, and there was a, a very growing movement uh, among students. Yeah, and the way that artists participated in that movement as well it was massive. It was very strong and uh, unforgettable. 
it's unforgettable, so we cannot forget. We have to, you know, rebuild our forces, reorganize our ideas and write and gather, and that's it. Well, I have one more question before we open it up for more questions from the audience here, but, you know, I think it's really beautiful the way that your work integrates uh, political context, integrates historic context, and still feels um, really personal and really connected to the human experience. Yeah. And I wonder if you could speak to what your process is in writing that helps yes. you to kind of integrate all of those things. I think it's a question that a lot of us have. How do we integrate a political context into our artistic pro process? It's difficult because I have a very high perception of art and creative writing, which I respect a lot. And I was telling you that I never did slogans. But I trust in human beings and I trust in my country and all the, the, the cultural process in my island. So that's something I, I defend because I have been a witness and at the same time part of it. So uh, I would like always to say that uh, there are things that we cannot admit, we cannot accept. If you accept what is happening with Palestine, you are defeated. And I was the other day I was talking with someone I said, quoting a, a wonderful colleague and friend and brother, Rogelio Martinez Fure, who passed away last year. And he used to say, the racial prejudice is defeated, but not dead. So a defeat is not, is, is, is not a, it's a victory for them because ever since you see that they've reborn and rebirth and, and everything, so we have to be in guard. Otherwise, you are nonsense and you are stupid and you are... I, 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 sometimes I feel like, uh, if I don't write those things, you know, I feel like uh, someone who is accepting those crimes, I will never. We should never accept those crimes. Yeah. Not at all, not at all. Thank you, Nancy. This has been an amazing conversation. I want to open it to the audience um, for questions. And Tahia will come and pass the mic. Maybe we'll take two questions, three questions at once, and then, and then Nancy can have a chance to respond. Um, so if there are questions now, raise your hand. It looks like we have question here, question here. We'll do these three and then give it a chance to answer. Thank you. Glad to uh, see you, uh, Nancy Morhon, once again. Um, uh, t two, two things. Um, uh, as a, as a, as a, as a, a long-time uh, Cuban artist, They had nothing to do with the steady diet of lies that we in the U.S. you know are, are fed regarding uh, censorship in Cuba, repression, and so forth, etc. But nevertheless, in Cuba during the the 70s and maybe part of the 80s, there was a, a narrowness, a, a gray period, I believe it's called, that um, members of uh, the Union of Artists of Writers in Cuba, um, uh, artists like Norberto Codina and others. Uh, were very forward in, in, in speaking out against. Uh, um, I, it, to my knowledge, their, 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 their campaign uh, helped bring to, more to the center uh, the uh, discussions about racism, uh, uh, homophobia. Um, anyway, uh, what, what, what's your point of view on that period and the battle that, that revolutionary artists in Cuba led to, 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 br to break out of that? Um, and the second thing, um, thank you for mentioning George Floyd. 
Um, he here was a symbol of the many, many uh, um, uh, police brutality victims. Today in particular happens to be the seven year anniversary. brutality, getting families together to demand two things, prosecution of cops, reopening of cases. So anyway, that, that happens to be the I thank you because he's a symbol of not just he himself, but the many cases. Thank you for your work and uh, Well, what was, what, what is your question? Um, the, the, the first part just had, uh, um, uh, w w what is your point of view of, uh, of the period in Cuba in the 70s, maybe part of the 80s, of the so-called gray period? Yes. And the fight against that? Yes. Well, that's, th that's a, a, a very past and overcome period. Structure. this great period because our generation at, at that time we were very, very young it meant many things Not to follow cultural institutions, not to follow the mistakes of Eastern Europe countries. So Cuba never, 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 uh, from my point of view, created an atmosphere against creative writings. Not at all. There was a case which is the Eberto Padilla's case, but it was not a majority. Uh, you talk about censorship. Uh, it was not the case of censorship. There was a case, even at Casa de las Americas, we have published recently a, hu a very uh, big and huge volume on the story of that case. We have at CAS a collection uh, called Valoración Multiple, which is uh, to, it's a recopilation of studies and writings on a writer or a period. And they did very, very, very huge uh, volume on that period, okay? Around Padilla's case. But that moment, it is not the whole moment for Cuban culture. It was uh, manipulated, and sometimes they didn't speak uh, honestly about it. They wanted to have like a victim who was not Padilla. So there are many other essays for younger critics that uh, they are thrown in a debate about the term peri uh, periodo gris, quinquenio gris, which was created by 
another important a member of the academy, Ambrosio Forné, who created that name. Uh, but it's just a debate, which means there is a debate. It's very important to know it. But uh, I reject the idea of, of having in, in our country a censorship in terms of what we know in Western world as, as censorship. We don't have paper, for instance, and nobody cares, except yourself. Who cares about the lack of paper in Cuba because of the harassment of, of American administrations? Nobody cares. And our pro one of our problems is that lack of paper. And nobody, there are people who speak, who talk, but at the last minute, they don't realize that uh, that movement is increasing, you know, the harassment to Cuban people. Not to writers and to artists, we do our best. We are not, uh, I don't feel myself, I don't feel guilty, of course. But at the, at the same time, I cannot feel guilty. I work in my country, I do my best, I write, but we have a lack of paper. Nobody comes to help in that sense. And we have to be very, we have to be careful in terms of, of not following and not supporting the slogans that our enemies feed. Okay? Thank you. Okay, we have a question here we'll take and then we'll go to this side. Thank you, and my name is uh, Ike Naham from the Cuba C New York, New Jersey Coalition. And I wanna just tell you how Thrilled all of us are. I'm so happy to see folks here today to salute you for the, the amazing legacy of your work uh, and to this day, and that not only represents the greatest uh, artistic creativity that the Cuban Revolution has pursued, but also in a way uh, your poetry registers the whole course of the Cuban Revolution. So. Uh, I wanted to note, uh, and this is connected, I think, to the, to the last question, uh, that period of time anyway, uh, which was at the height of the Vietnam War period, yes. which impacted on those in my generation as the premier revolutionary national liberation struggle that became the center of world politics. It just so happens that yesterday was the 70th anniversary of the victory at Dien Bien Phu uh, of the Vietnamese Liberation Forces. That, that's right, May 10th, 1954, the final decisive victory, and um, which inspired Fidel, inspired Che, inspired yeah. Yasser Arafat, inspired Pedro Albizu Campos, it inspired Malcolm X. It was a decisive turning point in uh, 20th century history, and I would like for for you to, in connection yes. with that, to talk about that, because I know you've written some beautiful poetry about it also. Thank yeah, you thank so you much. For, for thank you for here. your question. Thank, thank you for your question. It's welcome. Uh, it is just what I was talking recently about the, the Afro-Asiatic balcony. Cuba came to the Afro-Asiatic balcony. It's a, it was a wonderful moment, but everything was, clearer at the, at the Vietnam War. Uh, Indian food, that was, it was so clear, so transparent. And actually, we have a confusion. For instance, all you said, I support all you said, but there are confusion among others, that they don't understand what's, what is going on. So one of the goals of gatherings like this is just to know that we have to be certain. The, 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 the things we're defending. So we cannot defend invasions. 
as a natural thing. Invasions and taking other the territories are of other people. It's so it's an aberration. It's a disease. It's a mental disease. And we should read, I recommend always to read again and again. Franz Fanon, Amilcar Cabral, the people who really understood what was going on. Uh, because at, at the time of the 60s, you know, there was this term of coexistencia pacifica. And I was talking recently about the experience I did have as a teenager, I was almost a, a teenager, about I've listened to Amilka Cabral talking about that term. And uh, the Vietnam War was taking place, and uh, a leader like Ho Chi Minh was, was not as known as he deserved. And actually, all those things are so clear. But these things are, in a way, a manner, a new manner, but it's the same manner of invading and, you know, the, I don't find a term, I, I'm praising someone here, asking, requesting someone to, to translate Filosofia del Despojo, which is a very interesting idea on Fidel Castro. Uh, we now, uh, we are, you know, completely dizzy in spite of the cruel situation of the Palestines. And it's awful to think that's normal. It's awful to think that they deserve what they are suffering. So we need to read, we need to study so many things to do. And I think that gatherings that, like this one would be useful for understanding the meaning of culture and the meaning of civilization. Nobody has a right of killing someone because you have a weapon, you don't have a weapon, and then I shoot you. Oh. That's really bad, really bad. And we are in that hole. It's a hole. We are living in a hole. I don't know when we're going to you know, stand up and stop it. I think we have one question in the back here, and then we'll come back. We have many, many questions. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. So we'll go here, and then we'll come back to you. Go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight and sharing your words with us. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about your life. Um, I believe you were 14 years old when the revolution triumphed in Cuba, and that's such a transformative age um, to be witnessing all of that. And I just wonder if you could share what it was like uh, from your perspective to go through that and what lessons you still carry today and wisdom you carry from that experience, um, seeing society be transformed. And also um, interested about your parents. I believe they were militant and trade unit, unionists and um, just interested um, what it was like being that age and um, experiencing um, that transformation with, uh, with their kind of uh, parental oversight as well? No, it's very simple. I have to say that, well, my, my, my mother was a seamstress and my father w was a uh, stibador. And then, well, they, they were trade unionist, but there was a process in which they were, in a way, engaged. So I always, uh, I've realized that my father was very anguished because he had no money to pay my entrance into the university, which was very, very expensive. Around 100 pesos, 100 pesos at that time was a fortune. And he could not, and he could not. Finally, in 1961, I uh, engaged myself in teaching and people to read and to write and so forth. I had a failure in French language 
And finally, during that year, I recovered from that failure. So in 1960, uh, February 14, 1962, I entered to the university because it was free. Edu not only the university, education for, was free for Cubans. I wouldn't be here talking like this with you if there was not that the process that uh, we have lived. I did have 14 years old when the revolution in 1959. So uh, now it's so easy to say so, but I, I could become a professional because of that process and because of Cuban revolution. It is not a slogan, it is my life. It is my life. I, it, it was possible for us to, for me to learn French, which is my specialization. My specialization is not English. What I, what I chose was the, the French language, and I did a license on French literature, but applicated to the Caribbean, to the French Caribbean, the world of France Fanon and the world of MSS and Edouard Glissant. Where they were authors very aware of colonialism. And they taught me about all the roots of, of colonial, colonial times and the meaning of slavery in a, a plantation economy like Cuba. So, uh, and I am really proud of that. I, I was lucky because I, I became a translator, and I translated a lot. I translated uh, books and so forth, but the most important experience was to translate personally. That's why I'm telling you I met Amica Cabral personally. And uh, he taught so many things. And I met personally uh, Fanon's widow, who attended the, the, the Tricontinental Conference in January 1966. All of that, life cares, you know? Lives matter, blacks or whites or whatever. Life matters. So uh, my experience in Cuba, it's magnifique, it's uh, outstanding, and I wouldn't be this, the person I am without it. And I would say we wouldn't be the people we are without the Cuban Revolution either. I know, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. We have, okay, we're gonna go back to this side of the room. There are many okay. questions, so we'll, we'll go to There's someone, this lady, this lady, which is a friend of mine, that lady. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go to question here, and then we're gonna come back to you in, a, in one moment. Uh, and this meeting is a, an affirmative action. This is an affirmative action. Nancy. No kidding. Jorgina yes. Herrera Presente. Bueno, I've spent 23 years teaching playback theater in Cuba. There are five companies of my students now, and we have earned the patron de la Sociedad Cultural Jose Marti, the Society of the Teaching Martiano, and we have five companies, and we are working to sponsor a conference that is going to take place in Havana next January, at the end of January. And I want to tell you about it because we're hoping for a big delegation from the United States. The conference is called Por el Equilibrio del Mundo, for a world in balance. Good. And this is the sixth episode of this conference. And we have participated with Playback Theater, which is improvisatory, participative, community theater. And we're working in the community cultural centers throughout the island. And we're building for this conference. 
So I want you to know that on the internet, you can find the call for this conference. And we're going to have a, a build for it. I'm Susan Metz, M-E-T-Z. And you can see me, and I'll give you a copy of my card so we can stay in contact. Because we have to go there, we have to bring paper, we have to bring whatever we can, we have to make our relationships. Because, Nancy, you mentioned confusion. And that's the thing I'm extremely concerned about. Because it's, things are so hard there that all the young people are terribly pained and disturbed and they are leaving. And, and this is so hard on us too because I have a young couple who are staying with me and they need a room and a bathroom. So talk to me if you can help us find a place for Leo and Ellie. However, more important than that, Nancy, is how are we going to, to remind the young people in Cuba that it's the blockade that's interrupting with their, their future? Ever and since. not the, the very minimal, there is corruption there, let's face it. There are collaborators. Don't think, you know, everything is revolution. And no, it's not true. Havana looks like a, 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 a phantom town sometimes at night because what used to be the biggest cultural gathering on 23, some of the buildings are completely blacked out now in the evening, and it's startling, it's shocking. I've been going back and forth for 23 years, and, and there's a lot of confusion. Those kids think that because they see some differences now in class structure, which is unfortunately happening, that the best thing for them is to leave. So what are we going to do about that? I mean, where is the education that we can offer to say, look, the answer is not to leave. You had a revolution. You had a struggle. It's not the same now. You know, Diaz Canel is not Fidel. Thank you. Nancy, help us. Figure that one out. So for I cannot recall your name. Um, we're gonna we're gonna close out for the night, but this has just been an amazing evening um, with Nancy Morejon. So we'll have one question here, and we'll see if we have time for one tiny question, and then let you close out. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Ruf Maldonado. I also know Nancy from my research on Cuban theater in um, over the past decades and. Uh, I didn't see you last time I was there because you were in uh, the pen uh, thing that was going on and the Buena Fe was happening at the same time I was there in May and June last uh, the, year. The, the, yeah. um, the, the story of uh, the poetry committee in Paris and so forth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you were there? No, I was in Havana at oh. that time, so I was getting all the news and, and the, um, you know, the solidarity from the international um, peoples were was yes. coming through Cuba yes. and I was so happy to be in Cuba I mean even though that was going on and it was horrible but it was wonderful to be there and so um, and of course now we have all this cancellation of oh, just one we're gonna just continue yeah. go please, ahead go please ahead. don't interrupt me because my my um, I, 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 I mean we are here to 
um, to talk, and, and I'm a friend of Susan Metz as well, but when I was in Cuba, I, I do research on theater. So I put on my sneakers and I'm running from theater to theater for the whole time I'm there. And the theaters are operating and they're selling out, and I mean sell, selling um, out seats. And so my question is, now that we're in the United States and we're seeing all of this, um, you know, the uh, uprisings that are being fomented by external forces, and so I'm wondering what the uh, Cuban uh, responses to those. That when I was there, uh, I mean, for example, Tanya Bruguera, and I'm so I'm so happy to be here in this forum because I can actually talk about the truth about Cuban theater with people who know about the culture, and that uh, if they're saying it's racism in Cuba, uh, you know, in Cuba the police are not killing blacks. So, um, so how are the Cuban artists in particular, I mean, I see what the responses are to um, international people coming and saying that they're standing up for the Cuban artists, but you know, what are the Cubans doing? Thank you so much. And I'm gonna, can we just allow one more question then you can finish, close everything out all together? It's more of a, okay. To hear, there's one more question up here in the front and that's how we'll close. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, my question is around uh, poetry and gender. Um, when I was studying Latin American literature, my references to uh, literature and particular poetry and Afro-Caribbean poetry were mostly of men, right? Nicolás Guillén, uh, Luis Pales Matos from Puerto Rico, Langston Hughes in the United States, and those were amazing references. But to have the voice of a woman be the references of that history, of our identity, of social and political issues, it is just so amazing. So I want to know if you have encountered uh, challenges as becoming a voice for um, these issues, even in revolutionary Cuba. Thank you. Thanks for your question. The creative writing act as a challenge, you are lost. What I mean by that, that you have to have a, a force, an energy to say things, but to try to tell your readers that you're part of that process. Because when I was teaching in 1961, my neighbors around and so forth, I could not imagine that I was enlarging the possibility and the number of readers that I could reach myself. So there are things that you cannot imagine. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't feel myself like a magician or someone that can tell the future. No, 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 none of that. I do trust that poetry is working, it's a job. Uh, I study, I read, I, I do many, many, many things. Uh, and I do have, let's say, uh, a commitment to my people. Gender and race are important, very important, but they have to, to, they are like birds of a feather that fly together. You need to know that, and that I won't be able or prepare to go away, to go apart from that. And sometimes those are challenges are the challenges with an editor, a publisher, but it's not with Cuban revolution. It's never with revolution. I may love or not the publisher that I need to make my books. That's another thing. And that is always a challenge. You, you, I may love the mayor of my town or not. It, it means nothing. The important thing is to defend our beings, our lives. And, and the Cuban revolution for me is uh, holy. And I'm, I'm choosing that word because it, it, it's that, it's a holy thing. 
Um, I, I don't make business with that. I try to be the, the, the most honest. Uh, uh, relating to related to the the number of women that write uh, today, uh, they are in, in fine art. It's very interesting what is going on, uh, and with uh, poets and so forth. And I would like now to recommend uh, a series of visual arts videos done by uh, my friend Juana Maria Cordones Cook. She's based in, she's from Uruguay, and she's based in Missouri. And she have put together, I, I call it an encyclopedia of Cuban art. And uh, of course there are Georgina Herrera, and there, there is Belki Sayon, who committed suicide, and everybody knows, but is a, a wonderful artist, very interesting artist. Uh, created by uh, Cuban education in terms of art, uh, and many others, uh, uh, painters like Mendive, and uh, uh, there are many other women that I cannot recall exactly now, but they are, she has put together around almost 40, almost 40 of those audiovisuals of people who are in Havana or in Santiago, in Cienfuegos, and, and that's very inspiring because it's the way we work and the way artists do and the way artists survive. We survive, why? Because we're in a country harassed, never forget that, that word, harassed by imperialism, and that's true. It has been such a pleasure, Nancy Morejon, to have you on stage here tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you so much. We're so lucky to be able to hear your poems, to hear your stories, to be inspired in order to continue to make poetry, make writing, make art that fights against this imperialism that we have to fight against Thank you forever. so much for your welcoming, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure, if you haven't already, make sure on your way out to pick up the Nancy Morejon chat book um, that's, that is released tonight. Thank you so much for being here, and we'll see you in the streets.